This is Human Rights Watch. This is on your website. Human rights in danger. What is happening to human rights in the world? The United States, Donald Trump is the next president of the United States. He has said many things against human rights. I'm quoting you. He has said, for example, he blamed uh, people who have come to the U.S. from other countries for problems with money and jobs. Well, some of those criticisms are legitimate and rooted in fact and economics. Then he said he made fun of someone with a disability. How is mocking someone or being rude a threat to human rights? I mean, I know you don't like it. I don't like it either. But it's not a threat to human rights. Like, well, what is that? A president is supposed to uphold the rights of everybody, including the disabled. You don't want a president who, rather than protecting the disabled, mocks them. So mocking somebody so mocking is an attack on everybody who shares their characteristics? What, what, what are you saying? It's, it's illustrative of a president who is not terribly interested in defending the rights of the unpopular. That's our concern. How was candidate Trump's rudeness to a disabled New York Times reporter, illustrative as you put it, of his feelings about the disabled generally? How was that undermining the rights of disabled people by mocking one New York Times reporter who was disabled? It's well, not, actually. We, we all and saw that you know, little thing he did. It was mocking a disabled person. You know? So that was, is not the kind of respect for the disabled that you look for in a president whose job, among other but things, is to protect But how does that undermine the their disabled. rights? I'm well, what, quoting you. How does okay. that undermine their well, rights? Let me explain. We'll go back to the report. What we highlighted in that report is that here is a first a candidate, now a president, who claims this special insight into what the people want and has used that insight to trample on actual people and their rights. Look, you're not being, I, I think there are things to worry about, and I think you're the guy to bring those to our attention. But when you start claiming that making fun of a New York Times reporter is an attack on all disabled people, you undermine your Wait, credibility. You're the one we who began, said that. You're the one who said that. I said, it says, it says that right is, here. Where, no, no, no. I said that somebody who mocks the disabled or jokes about groping women or disparages black people as living in these hell holes in inner cities or says that all Mexicans are criminals or treats all Muslims or all Syrian refugees as would-be terrorists. That is not the respect for individual difference that I look for in a president whose job it is to protect the rights of us all. Look, what you're doing is engaging in a political piece of political no. rhetoric what is Rather that mean? than a sober critique politics. of human rights. So the Constitution guarantees, and the courts have upheld this, the right of individuals to keep and bear arms. That is under attack by a lot of politicians in this country who are trying to take away people's right, law-abiding people's right, uh, to, to exercise their Second Amendment uh, guarantee. That is an attack on their human rights as defined by the Constitution, and I've never heard you stand up against that. Why? Well, international human rights law, which is what we uphold, which is different from constitutional law, doesn't talk about the right to bear arms. Yes, I'm angry. Yes, I am outraged. Yes, I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. That was Madonna. She's thought a lot about blowing up the White House during the Women's March on Washington last Saturday here in D.C. She's now talking to the Secret Service, I think. The march was a big success from a turnout perspective, and doubtless participants have used their involvement to reap millions of likes on Instagram and Facebook. But besides that, what were the marchers actually marching for? There's some confusion about that. This march was about equality. And that okay. was about, on women's issues specifically, access to quality, affordable health care, raising the minimum wage, equal pay for equal work. You know, we know that two thirds of people in this country on the minimum wage are women. So this was actually an economic argument. It was a, a health care argument. And then there were also extension issues, like for immigration reform uh, to go against Donald Trump and the Republican Party's climate change agenda, uh, which uh, we don't think we're not going to debate climate science tonight. Um, but we know that the left does not agree with that racial criminal justice reform, uh, basically the Democratic platform. So it's basically just kind of a, a bully of of every sort of well, fashionable when you have millions of people. Issue. Well, but when you I, have millions of people turn out, they're there well, for sure. different reasons. Women's issues, women's rights have become a euphemism for abortion, which strikes me as a little ghoulish to reduce women's issues to killing. I mean, is that really what it's about? That's what it seems to be about. Well, if I it's not about that, why didn't they let the pro-life people march? Pro-life groups don't accept pro-choice women's right to feel this way. They, they want to overturn Roe v. Wade, and that's a key component of this platform. Whether people like it or not, abortion is health care in this country. So last year on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade, you all issued a press release saying that the Sierra Club stands in solidarity, I think I'm quoting, with Planned Parenthood. Now, people feel that way, okay. 
What does that have to do with the environment? Why does legal abortion make the environment better? Well, we believe in empowering women's rights. We think that uh, women who have rights uh, and who have the ability to have choice about their reproductive, um, make, make their own reproductive choices, uh, will help to produce strong families and will help to protect the environment at the same time. How specifically does more abortion or legal abortion help the environment? Well, it helps to address uh, the number of people that we have on this planet. Uh, we feel that one of the ways in which we can get to a sustainable population is to empower women uh, to make choices about their own families. You've Shit issued that. a press release saying, and I'm quoting, the lack of access to safe restrooms for transgender nonconforming citizens is an urgent matter. It may be. Why is it an urgent matter for the Sierra Club? What does that have to do with uh, the environment? Again, we think it's the right thing to do. The Sierra Club is the country's oldest and largest environmental organization. We're an iconic organization, whether you like us or not. You used to be a member of ours. Maybe you are still you are. Are you even listening to my questions? What does it have to do with the environment? I'm not attacking your position on it. I want to know why it's germane to the mission of the Sierra Club. Can you answer that we, or no? I was about to answer it before you interrupted me. I was saying we took a position, we take a position on the border wall or on reproductive rights, we join the Women's March, or on transgender rights, because we think it's the right thing to do. That's fine, then become, we'll go work for the DNC, but you're not running an environmental group, you're running a, a left-wing advocacy organization with every trendy issue gets thrown into the same basket and it dilutes your mission. Do you not see that, or no? California Assemblyman Mark Levine is crafting a new bill that would require public schools in the state to teach about the subject of Russian hacking we need to understand Russian interference in the 2016 election and its impacts on foreign policy to make sure that we have an American century ahead of us like we've had behind us when we're right. America is in full control of its destiny. But the point is we don't understand the effect of Russia in the election right now. The War of 1812 was 200 years ago. Marshall Plan was 70 years ago. We have a vantage. We sort of, we get it now. We have perspective. We have no perspective on what happened, and basically what you're suggesting is adding propaganda from a politician into textbooks, and why should I be in favor of that? Well, the intelligence community had an assessment where they agreed that the Russian government and Vladimir Putin himself had the boldest move ever in their interference in our election. Usually winners write the history books, but we need to make sure that the truth is in our that history losers books, write the history it's not books? papered over by the president. <laughs> Okay. No, what you're doing is trying to get losers to write the history. Well, look, I just want historians to write the history books. There's nothing to substantiate your claims. We don't know Russia's intent. We don't know the extent to which they influence this election. Those are unknowable right now, and you know that as well as I do. Let me just ask you, how would you feel as a parent, and I think you are a parent, if your kids' textbooks had political claims that were not basically substantiated, and they were clearly partisan, and they were inserted by some politician you didn't agree with? Wouldn't that enrage you? There's so let's get into the weeds in on this. Yeah, let's get on in, in the weeds on this. So what would happen is that California has an instructional quality commission that looks at curriculum for the different subjects. They would make an assessment of how to include this. They would then make a recommendation that can be approved and accepted, revised, modified, or even rejected by the State Board of Education. And so that's how curriculum is developed. Politicians will not have a hand in what is written in our history books, and nor should they. <laughs> what do you mean? You're writing a bill to require this, so by definition you have a hand in it, and you're saying that white supremacy caused Trump's election. So if you could just briefly define white supremacy, because I've never heard anybody do that, and explain how this works. So first, what I mean by white supremacy is a both a um, social, political, economic commitment to the promotion of people who pass as, as white. Uh, and when we look at the history of the nation for the past 240 years, we see that as immigrants have come to the country and claimed whiteness and been enveloped into the fold of whiteness, that um, they've done very well in, in this country. And they have, in large part, outpaced and outmeasured other racial groups due to a series of advantages that have been given to them. So that's, in part, what I mean by, by white supremacy. It's gender dynamics, it's heteronormativity, it's capitalism, it's lots of these things that have led to uh, that type of, of dominance. Here, here's the main problem with your theory, is for, from what I can tell. So for the last 50 years, the country's been totally transformed by immigration, since the 65 Immigration Act. And we've admitted about 60 million immigrants into this country legally in 50 years. That's an awful lot in a country of 325 million or whatever it is. It's a lot of people. Totally changed the demographic balance of the country. Only 12% of them came from Europe. Why would a, a country based on and committed to the perpetuation of white supremacy let in 60 million people, only 12% of whom are from Europe? 
Seems a little weird, no? No, not weird at all. I mean, your point makes sense if you don't think about it. In 1965, 84% of the country was white. 2015, 62%. That's a massive change in 50 years. Why would white supremacists allow that to happen? Well, white supremacists need the help now, don't they? They need people to do the work that they don't want to do themselves. But it's a democracy in which the majority chooses the government and the way of life. And so we know as a demographic matter that it's going to be a majority non-white country soon. That was a decision made by white people because it's a majority white country. And they're voluntarily allowing the country to become non-white and no one's yelling about it or whatever. I mean, I, you know, you can, whatever you think of that, that's not the behavior of a white supremacist country, is it? Well, I think it is. I, and since I study that, that, that is the behavior of a white supremacist country. Do you have tenure, by the way? I do. So, like, nothing you say, no matter how silly, can ever get you fired? Is that true? Oh, there are plenty of things that could get me fired, but I'm good at my job. Hmm. Okay. In a piece written for Washington Square News, that's NYU's student newspaper, grad student Kouros Esmaili says the college Republicans ought to be kicked off campus for inviting McGinnis to speak there. McGinnis's beliefs, he says, quote, are beyond our sense of democratic values and debate and therefore ought to be suppressed. Horace Ismaili joins us tonight from New York. My argument was suppressed, so I want to sort of like be okay. able to sort of well, say tell it. us, okay, then let, let's just make this really simple for our viewers right. who don't know the backstory here. Your op-ed that you wrote for this paper appears mm -hmm. to suggest the Republicans at NYU should be sanctioned in some way for daring to have Gavin McGinnis on campus. So, so what I'm trying to, well, what I, one of the sentences that was, that was actually taken out, which made me very angry, was the question, does the university, is it obliged to protect the speech of someone who comes on campus and advocates and recruits for Al-Qaeda? Okay. What do you think about that? It's not I a want question to for college administrators to decide. It's been decided by the Supreme Court in a case called Brandenburg versus Ohio, 1969, the last big free speech case. And the upshot of it is that advocating violence is indeed protected speech. And of course, politicians do it all the time. We ought to bomb this country or bomb that country. Advocating violence, that's protected by the First Amendment. What is not protected is inciting violence, imminent violence, destruction or mayhem. I cannot say, go smash the windows of that liquor store. So here's my point. Anything Gavin McGinnis conceivably said or would have said on your campus is protected speech. Now, if you'd taken 10 minutes to Google this, you'd know that. And so there's really not a close call here. What he's doing is protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. So for you to say that people should be sanctioned. Do you think people should recruit for Al-Qaeda on a college campus? Should well, of course, I'm completely against Al-Qaeda. Okay, do you, so you think they should be protected that. by administrators on a campus? I think people ought to be able to express their political views, no matter how repugnant to you or me or anyone else, as long mm -hmm. as they, in accordance with the Supreme Court decision from 1969, are not inciting imminent violence. I believe I've, I'm understanding that correctly, and I think that you should. And I think the college administrators should understand No, I do, I do believe that. that. I absolutely, okay. I absolutely so do believe that. But I also are, believe, I also believe that there are arguments, there are points to be made that are beyond the pale of responsible dialogue. If I want to know what the new rules are, as created by you, the graduate student, what are the rules for, as you said, rational rules. conversation? I don't pretend to create so rules. So where can I go on the internet to find out what speech is protected and what speech isn't protected, according to you and your friends at NYU? Is there, is there a, a, a website we that tells me? We don't make rules. I don't, I don't pretend to oh, make rules. Oh, because you keep I'm not, I, I don't want to be in a position of being administrator well, of a college. It's a very difficult job. I, that's, not, that's not what, what I want to do. Okay, but, but how do I, college how do I know what the rules administrators are? Right, are responsible right. for the safety of their students on campus. Right? And when someone comes and advocates, ad, uh -huh. advocates for, for the right. idea, the racist so, can, ideas, right, it can hurt people. Right? So, so if, I were to, if I were to go to a rally and people said, I'm just pulling this out of thin air, pigs in a blanket fry like bacon about police officers advocating the killing of cops. I mean, you would say that's unacceptable. That should not be allowed. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying if student group wants to have a discussion about police brutality no, no. or, if they were to or use, racism. Stop, stop. If they were to use that phrase, if they were to use that phrase, pigs in a blanket, fry like bacon. I'm not interested in the phrase. I'm not going to de debate you over this oh, phrase should be allowed because or not. you have no principles. That's why.